Hi, everybody, and welcome to The Week Ahead. I'm Tony Nash, and today we're joined by Markets and Mayhem, Tracy Schuchart and Albert Marco. Guys, thanks so much for joining us. Um, we've got a lot to talk about today. The first is the reacceleration of inflation uh, we saw with CPI, and we want to talk about that reacceleration and the impacts on markets and other things. Uh, we'll talk about that with Mayhem. Uh, next, we want to talk about uh, peak oil. There's a, a note out this week about peak oil by 2030. And so we want to uh, talk with Tracy about that and how re realistic that is. Uh, and then finally, we want to talk with Albert about uh, investments that you need to keep an eye on going into an election year. Um, Albert's obviously um, well versed in both elections and in markets, and, and it'll be important uh, to have that discussion with him. So before we get started, I want to let you know about a new free tier we have within CI Markets, our global market forecasting platform. We want to share the power of CI Markets with everyone. So we've made a few things free. First, economics. We share all of our global economics forecasts for the top 50 economies. We also share our major currency forecasts, as well as Nikkei 100 stocks. So you can get a look at what do our stock forecasts look like. There is no credit card required. You can just sign up on our website and get started right away. So check it out, CA Markets free. Look at the link below and get started ASAP. Thank you. So guys, thanks everyone for joining us. Ma'am, I, I wanna uh, talk with you first. We've talked about the reacceleration of inflation in Q3 for a long time on this show. Uh, and we've started to see it again, most acutely with energy prices, of course. Um, retail sales came in stronger than expected. CPI came in line. Um, so at the same time, we're seeing jolts say down below nine million, which it's still you know eight and a half something, still pretty good. Um, and we're seeing pressure on things like residential real estate, uh, and we all know about the pain in commercial real estate. So uh, a few questions for you first. How do you expect the reacceleration of inflation to impact the sector rotation? Um, you tweeted a chart out about this. Um, so can you can you talk us through that? Yeah, sure. I mean, we're in the early stages of what might be a reacceleration of inflation. We're seeing a little bit of that. Of course, commodity prices are leading the way, but the PPI print we got yesterday, the biggest contributor was energy and the biggest contributor from energy was diesel fuel. Diesel's used to move everything everywhere. So it's a pretty big deal when that price starts to go up. It has secondary impacts that can boost prices elsewhere. So I think that's that's something to keep an eye on. We got import export. Uh, we got import prices today. They came up up 0.5% month over month, which was greater than the 0.3% expected and you know much higher than last month at a tenth of a percent. You annualize that, that would be a 6% run rate, which would be kind of unacceptable for import costs rising. This is all on the back of a rising dollar. So it'd be interesting to see what that looks like if you know that wasn't the case. But nevertheless, I think that in terms of the rotation that it could spark, I think that old economy companies come back into favor, particularly energy stocks. We've had a really robust run in crude. I want to say it's up above. Uh, it's it's at. 52-week highs or close to 52-week highs. It's certainly at 2023 highs yesterday with the pricing that we saw. And I think that we're starting to see some areas where supply inelasticity is, is becoming a bigger problem because demand is starting to creep up. So I think for energy stocks who had a pretty bad quarter two in terms of their earnings, we're seeing the exact opposite backdrop this quarter or prices of energy are rising. So margins for these companies should be rising. And I think that presents an attractive opportunity for some of the better run companies for investors to look at the ones that have better margins, clean balance sheets as an opportunity here moving forward. Great. You know, it, it's interesting. I, I think this is the third week in a row where people have talked about the rotation into energy. And of course, Tracy and Albert have been saying this for a long time that We'd see prices reaccelerate in Q3 and um, that we'd see energy rise into the end of the year. So, you know, this is really um, uh, it, it's really consistent and it's it's kind of what we're seeing out there. So, you know, I, I, I want to understand your expectation of, say, a recession. Um, Tracy put a tweet out about this earlier this week uh, around bonds. So. Is a recession your baseline view and how would that impact some of the credit risks we see out there, um, meaning real estate and, and other things? So can so can we talk through this uh, with respect to, say, the 10 year um, and then around recession and then 
What are your expectations around credit risks? Sure. So in terms of the 10-year, there's a pretty decent positive correlation between the 10-year note yield and the price of oil. So I think as long as the price of oil is moving higher and people are becoming more concerned about forward risks for inflation, there is some upward pressure on rates that can still exist and still push these rates higher from where they are right now. Now, if that view starts to shift to one where people are more concerned about a recession, about a looming economic slowdown than they are about the rate of inflation, then we can start to see a bit of a different dynamic there. We also have some big unknowns. We have a huge basis trade with the largest amount of net short exposure to treasuries, which could add some fireworks into the mix. Now, granted, these folks are all long fixed income, but they have some positions that could work against them. It could add some volume. Even the Fed and Treasury are looking at this with a little bit of concern. Now, moving into the idea of a recession, I think it's something that becomes more likely. It's it's sort of like a it's it's forestalled but not canceled scenario. I don't believe that the soft landing is the most likely outcome for how this credit cycle uh, resolves. I still think we're still in that older credit cycle that the Fed and other central banks are doing what they can to end. And I don't think that we can get rid of the inflation boogeyman without some of that pain. So I think central bankers are motivated. I don't know that we're going to see a, a hike next week, but I think November, December is likely. And in terms of what that looks like, I'm going to have to look at really first quarter next year where I think we start to see more evidence of that becoming a scenario that plays out. I think we'll see some telltale signs in the fourth quarter leading into that. And what that looks like to me is actually a slowdown in the economy that amplifies credit risks. I don't think it's going to be the other way around. I think it's going to be that the economic slowing that we're seeing is going to boost up delinquency and default rates across a variety of different instruments. That's going to increase pressure, and that's where you're going to start to see some of those problems percolate. And if we look at, for example, the bank term funding program, we can see that it's now surging again. That borrowing by banks is on the rise because longer duration has lost value. I mean, we've seen bond yields creep up to the highest levels this year and uh, in some cases, the highest level in decades. And so there's a lot of pain on regional balance sheets. And they're going to that window again, telling the Fed, look, we need 100 cents on the dollar because we're, we're in a situation where we might have a bit of a liquidity crunch. But on the other side of it, the, the terms of borrowing from that window are actually somewhat favorable in an environment where they can lend out at you know 7% mortgage or 10% auto loan or you know credit cards or otherwise on even higher interest rates so we do see bank lending actually coming back in an environment where the bottom 50% of consumers don't even have $1000 or even $400 in a rainy day fund so if things slow down more I think that's where you start to see that domino effect that can hit credit markets but I think it's going to be more of the unemployment rate rising the jobless claims rising and the services industry breaking that really leads us down that path. So my roadmap is I'm looking for jobless claims at 300K a week. I'm looking at uh, for unemployment to rise meaningfully above 4%. And I'm looking for the services industry to go into some kind of multi-month contraction. We don't have any of those things in play yet. So that's why I'm looking forward towards the first quarter of next year with some eye on whether of these uh, this sort of path has manifested or not to qualify the probabilities of that playing out. But if you look at the yield curve inversion, if you look at leading economic indicators and other things that have been pretty accurate in, in forecasting prior recessions, all of them still say game on. Right. Tracy, that was your tweet. What do you think about that in terms of uh, mayhem's kind of aura of events? Um. Uh, as far as what the yield cur curve inversion, you know, yeah. I I know that everybody's looking at that. And what I think that we should at least keep in mind here is that this time may be different because, you know, the last, I mean, it's forecasted pretty much every recession to 2008, but the 2008 right after that is really when we put the pedal to the metal as far as, you know, quantitative easing and printing all of this money. Um, and so, I mean, we've never had a balance sheet this large um, and dealing with the yield curve inversion at the same time. And, you know, this really is not uh, my forte, to be honest with you, but I have, you know, I, I'm just thinking maybe that's why it's been prolonged for, you know, over 200 days or what it sure. is the longest in, in history. Um, or perhaps maybe this time it is different and we do get a soft landing. We'll have to see. Yeah. You know, Tony, I have, I have a, uh, the, the one piece of data that I actually looked at today, this morning and just smirked 
was the import prices increasing, right? Because the entire argument for some of the, for some people criticizing our uh, reinflation uh, argument for months now has been, oh well, we'll just import uh, deflation. Well, that's just certainly hell not happening at the moment. I mean, every, prices across the world are increasing. Pr prices of oil across the globe is increasing. Demand's increasing everywhere. So the the notion that we're going to be able to import deflation for the next two years is absolutely ludicrous and completely wrong. Right. I, I think, I, go ahead. Go ahead, Tracy. I, I also think we need to pay close attention as far as the inflation scenario goes right now is this United Auto Workers strike, because really, depending on how long that lasts, that puts 24,000 cars at risk of production a day. And we all know what happened in 2020 when we had the COVID shutdowns, that led to automobile shortages, which led to a run up in prices. And so I would be just be keeping an eye on that to see how long this actually lasts. A week, no, well, fine. But if this goes into some sort of prolonged strike, um, that also could be automobiles could be another inflation factor. That's also yeah. assuming that they make cars that don't get recalled every month. <laughs> But that's a that's a good point on cars, too, because cars have become unaffordable for a lot of people where they are at current mm -hmm. pricing, because people don't look at cars by price. They look at cars by monthly payment and mm -hmm. monthly payments have never been this high. So most people are already priced out of this market. You add in that scarcity that Tracy's talking about from a supply disruption, and that gets a lot worse. And it definitely passes through to inflation as well. I, I pay. It's interesting because I pay less for my G-Wagon than some that I know that some people pay for like a Hyundai Sonata, which is absurd. <laughs> like, absolutely absurd yeah if you, you got, got a great loan, deal if, if you got a loan and the re like within the last year you're paying i think you're paying closer like or slightly above what i pay for my for my payments right so ma'am you you made an interesting comment about cars you said people are priced out of the market i'm hearing that more and more that people are priced out of the market but then we see things like retail sales and consumption numbers that are higher are those numbers really just coming in based on kind of nominal price increases or is it really a volume of transactions? Because I, at these levels, I, I really do get worried about a lot of people being priced out of markets. Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think we have uh, a pretty staggering chasm between the bottom 50% and the top 20%. And I think that accounts for some of what we're seeing. You've got some folks who have never been doing better and they have no constraints on their consumption. They're the minority, but then you have the majority, majority and they're priced out of housing and they're priced out of automobiles and they're priced out of the lifestyle they used to enjoy. And I think that that's the dichotomy, the sort of K-shaped, if you can even call it recovery, at least outcome is playing a big role here. So I think that's something that we have to keep an eye on because that bottom half, that's where the risk is and that's where the risk continues to be amplified. And you see it in auto dealers. They're continuing to make concessions to sell cars. They continue to cut prices. They continue to do whatever they can. You are, they'll also buy your car at a higher price, just whatever they can do to massage the numbers to keep cash flow coming in. And the same thing's happening with home builders. Exactly. They're making massive concessions. So if, if you're the Fed and you're seeing that the bottom 50% are being kept out of markets, what can you do? I mean, the, Powell has spoke to this repeatedly saying that, you know, the Fed's sort of price stability mandate compels them to keep rates high for a long period of time to try to ameliorate that pressure. And I think that there is some truth to the fact that you're not going to be able to quell inflation by just destroying demand, but you can temporarily subdue it. So the Fed can sit there with the limited set of tools they have, and they can try to induce below trend economic growth, which is kind of a polite way of we're running a higher risk of a, of a recession to try to get the monetary policy outcome that we want to happen. On the other side of that, though, longer term, they don't have any tools to fix this. Once we get into inevitably a new credit cycle and structural inelasticity is still out there, as demand firms up, prices too will firm up and from probably a higher baseline. So I think that that sets us up for a bit of a vicious cycle of the Fed having to come in earlier and tighter, but also not ease as much into the next credit cycle, full well being aware of those dynamics, unless and until we have some kind of, you know, and good luck with this, but legislative and executive sanity on the matter of supply. I'm sorry to laugh. About no, that. It's, so, it's, it, it, we have to laugh or we're going to cry. <laughs> right. That's true. So, so ZERP is dead in our lifetimes. 
I don't know that it's dead in our lifetimes, but I think it's dead for the next five or 10 years, unless things go really, really abysmally wrong. Okay. Albert, do you think the Fed is out of tools? No. Do I think they're out of tools? No. Are they running out of runway? Yeah, I do think they're running out of runway. When they're you getting... say running out of runway, what do you mean? Well, the, the tools that they can use are, are are diminishing at the moment. I mean, let's, for instance, oil, I know that they use futures options, SPR releases, to uh, manipulate the price of oil to bring down CPI numbers. I mean, obviously, the SPR is being drained over and over again. They, they, they come up with a 2.9 million barrel purchase. And then like a week later, uh, the Biden administration says, "Oh well, we might release uh, some more S, uh, you know, SPR." They're running out. They're running out of runway at the moment, you know. And this is mainly because they've misjudged pretty much everything from day one. You know, the the, the accumulation of wealth, specifically from the boomers, uh, in in terms of housing and whatnot, is just runs ruin for all Fed policy. They can't they can't account for it. Hmm. That's actually an interesting point, too, in terms of labor scarcity, because the boomers have been the biggest component of the labor workforce that just during COVID, they said, I'm, go I'm not going to go to work anymore. And many never went back. And so mm. this whole, you know, tightness in the labor supply, it's not really that tight. If we if those folks came off the bench and, and really, you know, sadly, there would have to be some wealth destruction to encourage them to do that. The labor force scarcity issue would be largely ameliorated for at least, you know, three to five years. OK. Okay, um, interesting. And so, Albert, are you also looking? You know, if a recession is going to come, are are you also looking at say Q one of of twenty four? I, I would say I would say the latest of Q one of twenty four, and I don't think it's I I unfor I do actually think it's going to be a soft landing in terms of just the data alone. I don't know about the reality of the situation, but on, on in terms of data, I think it'll be a soft landing and pretty brief going into an election year. Heads up for a short break. Are you using the potential of AI in your portfolio management strategies? With an impressive 94.7% forecast accuracy on average, you can confidently integrate AI into your approach with CI markets. Visualize the potential volatility of your portfolio over the next 12 months and gain insights into specific assets that might experience fluctuations. This empowers you to make informed decisions on when to buy, sell, or hold. CI Markets covers a wide range of over 1,600 assets including stocks, commodities, forex, indices, and economic indicators. Imagine running limitless portfolio scenarios to optimize your gains. Curious about the outcome of removing or adding certain assets? Wondering how your portfolio might evolve in the next 3, 6, or 12 months? CI Markets equips you with answers to these crucial questions. Whether you seek a streamlined portfolio analysis, wish to explore diverse scenarios, or aspire to track your investments with precision, CI Markets is the ultimate tool for you. Ready to learn more? Visit us at completeintel.com slash markets. Thank you. And now back to the show. Interesting. Okay, great. Um, let's move on to, to crude markets. Um, Tracy, uh, you put a tweet out about um, uh, peak oil or peak um, fossil fuel demand by 2030. We had an IEA report recently saying that the world would hit peak fossil fuel demand by 2030. It's kind of hard, given the demand that we're seeing, it's kind of hard to say that with a straight face, but they actually published it. So um, we've got crude growth consumption, we've got OPEC supply cuts, we've got high crude and, and petrol prices. So OPEC responded this week, it wasn't pretty. It included words like, quote, such narratives only set the global energy system up to fail spectacularly, which is, um, as you say, you know, shots fired. So can you walk us through this? Are, are there realistic assumptions underlying the IEA assertion that fossil fuels will peak by 2030? No, absolutely not. They've and been wildly wrong for the last okay. 10 years. So what assumptions are they using? I mean, let's <laughs> figure that so, out. I mean, they've been wildly wrong about demand numbers for uh, for literally the last 10 years and, and supply numbers for even longer than that, right? They've always, you know, said they've always had supply way higher than it's ever been. And they've always misjudged demand numbers. Now, this really came into play during the Paris Accords when the IEA sort of 
decoupled itself from being an independent actual energy agency and kind of latched itself onto uh latched its on to the bureaucrats that run Europe and the United States essentially um mm -hmm. and then then you know that was at the Paris Accords and then you know they became an affiliate or it allied with the WEF in 2016 and so since then obviously their demeanor has been towards green energy push and so you know a lot of their reports of you know by I think they said EVs would be 50% of global consumption by now, back in 2006. By now. Yeah, right. which was wildly off. And they and every time they go back and they make revisions, but you never hear about the revisions because they quietly make their revisions. And so right now, I think they're, you know, I, I think they're not credible right now. I think they, they have an agenda and they're pushing that agenda. And so I think, unfortunately, you know, even OPEC last year, basically it kicked them out of being a secondary source of information, demand information in their uh, monthly reports and said, you're just not a credible agency anymore. We can't have you as a secondary source. And so OPEC doesn't trust the IEA anymore. Correct. 100%. Okay. Interesting. And so, yeah. And so if you look at this last report where they said we're going to hit peak demand, basically their assumption was global oil demand is only going to grow by 3 million barrels per day out to, you know, to, I think it was 2028 or 2030 is when they said that we were going to hit uh, the peak peak demand. However, if you look at the historical norms, oil demand has been growing at over 6 million barrels a day. So to suggest them from here on out, we're going to be at half of that in global growth is kind of a little bit unbelievable, right? Because you're just cutting oil demand in half for no real reason, especially when we look at emerging markets where we're still seeing demand growing. In fact, as a whole, if we look at emerging markets, it's, all, it's starting to surpass uh, uh, developing nations. So um, okay. so if we were to see, if 2030 really was peak oil, what would we be seeing by now? Well, you would have to see well, you would have to see not a breakdown in green energy technology that we're having right now, right? You've just had a bunch of wind companies say this is not feasible, economically feasible for us to do. Orsted in the United States, two big wind farms, they said we can't do this unless you know we raise our prices by sixty three percent, which obviously goes to the consumer. And they also said they're willing to work away, walk away from that project, um, no problem. If there it can't be some sort of solution, and that solution, i.e., would be a bunch of government subsidies, i.e., your tax dollars. Right. Um, so you have that, and then you just have Germany come out and say that over fifteen percent of their solar panels are in severe degradation. That's quicker than they initially Shocking. thought it was going to be, and so we're seeing these problems. And this is, you know, what I've been talking about this whole time. You can't frog leap technology, right? You can't just make a, a leap to technology that's just not there yet. And we're finding out now that this technology is more expensive than we thought. And it's in degradation a lot sooner than we thought. And so we're going to have to need to see, we're going to have to need to see a huge technology shift or, a, you know, fusion to start <laughs> to, to, to come into light really to be able to change this narrative at this point, because it's, it's just, we're not there yet. They're trying to push right. something that's just not there yet. So we talked last week about uh, nat gas in Asia and how that's becoming kind of a preferred feedstock in Asia. Um, and we saw this week about how um, in uh, Niger, uh, the government there is uh, changing the basis price of selling uranium to France. It's going to be up I don't know, 300 times or something because France was getting just a heck of a deal. So, um, so some of these things, the, the, the demand is increasing rapidly, say for nat gas um, and the basis price for some of the nuclear because of this Niger development could be changing for some of these countries. So do those, does that help us get beyond peak oil or does that prolong it because we already have the installed base for peak oil. Yeah, no, I think, you know, and peak oil, they include nat gas in that, 
mm. right? They include that gas and that, but you know, they take fossil fuels as a whole. Okay. And so, you know, yeah, nuclear would be fantastic, right? And we are seeing more nuclear projects come online. We're seeing a lot of mothballed, particularly in Japan, a lot of mothballed uh, facilities come back online. And that's, you know, that's great news, except for if you're talking about new projects, if you're talking about giga projects, major you know, nuclear projects, those take years. And so you're not really going to see those in the West where you already have projects that started years ago coming, uh, you know, coming into uh, use case within, you know, over this next decade, particularly in Asia. Um, you know, there's a lot of buzz about the new SMRs, right? And that technology is great. That's, they're faster to build. That's excellent. And so it's really- Sorry, what's an SMR? The small nuclear reactors. Okay. The small modular reactor. Okay. Is actually, the acronym. Um, but so you know that's great, but still those projects still take time to come online. And so you know you're still not getting away from you, you're still not getting away from fossil fuels, particularly as you're trying to wean a lot of these emerging markets off of coal. Right. So you're going to go to that gas. You're going to go to because you can't again, you can't leapfrog the technology. Yeah, they want to build wind and solar, but they're going to run into the same problems that the West is coming oh, in. Can't subsidize as much. OK, so um, what does that mean for markets? So, you know, we've talked for a long time about how there's underinvestment in the upstream. And we really haven't had upstream investment since, what, 2014 or something. I can't remember the year, the year that you've told us, but. But so do predictions like this just serve as justification for upstream companies to delay investment in the upstream? I don't think it, it serves as an incentive to delay. But again, you know, you're facing these problems that you're having governments tell them, we don't want you to be around in five years. So why are you going to, you know, invest all of this capital in something that the government? what's you know keeps telling you we want to get rid of and keeps you know there's a ton of obstacles that the biden administration and you know the eu commission has set on fossil fuels in in europe and in the u.s so it's just becoming more and more difficult and um you know these these people these companies want to keep investors and so how do you keep investors dividends stock buybacks <laughs> and things of that nature. So they're, you know, they're giving, they want to keep in, keep, keep investors around. There's not a lot, just not a lot of incentive right now to vote for CapEx. Okay. So short-term impact or shorter term impact, short to medium term impact on say energy companies or energy prices. Um, do you think this IEA prediction uh, has any impact in say the short to medium term, meaning one month to say three years? Will this have any sort of impact over the next one month to three years on crude prices, net gas prices, the value of XLE or something like that? No, absolutely not. Okay. Okay. Albert, what do you think? I don't really have much more to add. So Tracy pretty much <laughs> pretty much nailed that one. I just, you know, for me, it's just like, you know, the the this the notion that we're gonna be in some kind of like peak oil demand is just silly. I don't yeah. think it's silly. Yeah, we have to talk about these things, though, right? Because this is what's out there in markets, and we have to, you know, is this real or is this just? Yeah, but I mean, like Tracy you know, said, you know, a lot, a lot of it's political nonsense that they just, you know, spit out there because they have a narrative to tell. But saying that peak oil is going to be twenty thirty is just, I mean, that's years and years away. We we, we don't know what's going to happen after the U.S. election. A lot of it has to deal with like how policy gets implemented from here on out. You know, if we have a conservative government in the United States, things change drastically yeah. at that point. Having been in forecasting businesses for almost 30 years, if you're going to make a forecast or a prediction that's that far off of reality, you typically want to make it 15 to 20 years out so nobody remembers it when it happens, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? I mean, so, yeah. so they're saying 2030, which everyone's going to remember. And in 2030, they're going to point back and go, oh, those guys were crazy. It's, it's 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 silly. We have no idea who's going to win the U.S. elections. Policy can change on a dime. Right. Right. Ma'am, what do you think about this? Um, kind of these long or well, not even longer term, 20, peak oil by 2030. Are you seeing any reflection of this in markets? I think it's a fantasy. I think the peak oil we have to be concerned about is supply, not demand. 
And mm -hmm. I think that the biggest problem that we're confronting here is that policymakers are leading with fantasy and not reality. We want a green revolution. That's great. Let's see how we can make that happen without enough oil. Every single part of everything they're talking about involves using hydrocarbons. I mean, even solar panels, they need quartz mined out of the earth. They need coal mined out of the earth. You've got to combine these in really hot furnaces just to make that silicon surface everything i mean the the components of the wind turbines the magnets the metals the the sheer magnitude of this stuff there's so much hydrocarbons involved with building any of this so-called bridge to a renewable future that it's pure fantasy to say that we're going to be off of we're going to be seeing peak oil within the next decade or two in my opinion okay so i've had this belief for a while but i want you guys to tell me if i'm wrong so it seems to me that a lot of these fantasy visions of the green future are largely driven by uh, zero interest rate policy and negative interest rate policy. When there's no cost of money, we have subsidies and we have investments going into things that don't have a near-term payoff. Um, so if we had, if, if we continue to have an interest rate environment like we have now, do you think that these green energy plans will continue? Or is my is my thesis completely wrong? No, no it's, it's not it's, wrong. I mean, they're they're they they pile up debt for research development and implementation. I mean, anything from a wind to solar to you know, name your green technology is just laden with debt. And they can't they can't they can't take that on if we have interest rates this high. I think it's uh, it's an interesting burden when we're looking at solar technology that takes less than a quarter of the photonic energy that it is exposed to and converts it into electricity. That that right there is a huge problem that we're not more efficient because we can't hope to power anything from solar given how intermittent it is, how far the storage technology has to go and how we'd have to build really a modular grid. You can't really have centralized solar power at any conceivable scale that you're not going to start dealing with impedance issues for the amount they, because then you start saying, okay, we're getting less than 25%. Well, by the time you get to the end user, maybe you're getting 12% of that photonic yeah, energy into electricity. Maybe, maybe. That's it. That's exactly at right. I, I yeah. used to run, I used to run a solar cell research firm out of the Republic of Georgia years and years ago. And when I, I mean, I opened my eyes to a lot of the nonsense that comes out there. We have not made any, any headway in solar technology, we still use silicon cells, which are 22% theoretical max. Once you put on the filters and all the degradation, you're at anywhere between 10 and 15% at max when it comes to commercialized products. The stuff that you see that come out and say, oh, well, we got 44% in a lab. Yeah, that's for like two milliseconds under 300 suns before the thing gets blown up. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, and it's just, it's, it's, it's just complete nonsense. And we, 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 you know, if we really want to get into the whole solar thing, we really need to put in a lot of money and a lot of subsidies, which I don't think is feasible at the moment. It's just not affordable anymore. Right. I nope. mean, there's real money. No. Money yeah. costs money. Now money used to not cost money and mm -hmm. now money costs money. So, okay, great. Thanks guys. Um, so, Let's move on to the beneficiaries of election year largesse. And Albert, <laughs> you are the man uh, to talk to about this. So, My favorite topic, Tony. <laughs> that's right. So, Albert, of course, we've got an election coming up here in the U.S. So I've been told that maybe, just maybe, some U.S. politicians like to use legislation to give money to key voting blocks, allegedly, right? So, <laughs> As we head into an election year, what sectors can we expect to benefit from legislators spending the American taxpayers money to get reelected? Well, this is interesting because so it, it only it only happens really in a set circumstances when there is a, a majority of senators in a certain area being up for reelection, like we have in 2024, like we had in uh, uh, 2020 at that same time. Actually, we had a, we had a uh, sorry, 2018 in the midterms, but in the Rust Belt um, from pretty much actually from all the way from Montana to Pennsylvania up north, there's a lot of senators that are up for reelection. And in those areas, if you want to win a Senate seat, you have to address the rural vote. And if to address the rural vote, you need uh, votes from the oil sector and you need votes from the from the agricultural sector. 
right? And corn, I've, I've been on here before and I've mentioned corn as one of my favorite plays is if you want to get the rural vote, you better make sure that those corn fields are profitable at the moment. And they've, they've done a good job of suppressing corn, but going into 2024, you'll start seeing a lot of legislation with a lot of subsidies, perhaps uh, oil uh, ethanol waivers, which is one of the favor, which boosts up corn uh, prices. That'll get done uh, probably in March, April, May of next year. You know, at least they'll start talking about it. So that's, I mean, that's one of the, that's one of my favorite trades in an election year is wait till corn gets absolutely crushed in early, you know, February, March of 2024 and put a play on a position for a long position going into September, October, November. Interesting. Okay. So corn's number one. What else are you looking at? I, honestly, probably the auto industry at the moment, because it's such a big, it's such a big, uh, such a big headline. And there's a lot of demographic voters in that, those areas. Um, I think that they'll get some sort of subsidies going forward and into next year. I don't like playing the actual manufacturers. What I do like to play is the logistics that, you know, as long as the parts have to get delivered to get the cars made. I think Park Ohio is one of my favorite little companies that does that. So I think that's where I would I would you know position myself in. Great. OK, so we'll revisit this um, from time to time. Uh, Mayhem, do you have any any thoughts on favorite uh, investments that or or favorite sectors that politicians are going to goose going into the election? You know, I I don't. I haven't spent a lot of time thinking about this. But if I had one area that I think may be a potential beneficiary, it might be digital advertisers that uh, will see mm -hmm. a surge in demand during that period of time. Okay, that's really interesting. Okay, and Tracy, um, I would assume I could be wrong that there's going to be a lot of political pressure to um, to reduce energy prices, especially gasoline prices here in the U.S. before the election. So first of all, is my assumption true? And second of all, could that harm some of these refiners? We're, obviously, they're obviously they're going to try. Now, the thing is, is that the Republicans have no incentive to really help them out of that situation, right? Um, so, you know, they'd love to see high high gas prices going into an election, so they obviously can say. So, you know, I think it's going to be really difficult. Again, you know, what uh, Albert was talking about is they're, you know, they're, what did he say? They're running out of runway. So, you know, there's really not a lot that they can do right now. You know, you're really going to have to suppress you know, oil prices, um, you know, and, and which actually, you know, is better for refiners. <laughs> so that that's actually better. So if they are able to, you know, because if you reduce oil prices, that's less that they have to pay <laughs> and then they'll charge you more. And so I just think, you know, it's, it's nice and all for, you know, Biden to come out last night and say, I will reduce gasoline prices. Okay, well, give me a give me a solid plan for that, because, you know, I, there's just not a lot of options out there. And, you know, I, I think going through this election, I think oil companies are still going to, you know, remain. I, I think oil companies are going to remain strong because, again, like I said, there's just no incentive from the opposite, from the, the other side of the aisle to really help on that. Yeah, and I think their the, their best chance for getting oil prices down back into the mid seventies is for re recession fares to start popping up, and that's not till Q one really. And, and, it's, that, it's, and that doesn't help them either, right? <laughs> and it's funny, too, because with all this draining of the SPR to levels we haven't seen since 1985, the price of gasoline for the average American consumer is up over a buck and a half during the Biden presidency, mm -hmm. from just about two bucks to right. over three fifty. Yeah, this, this, is, this is mainly due to policy problems. I mean, they sit there and cut off, you know, pipelines. They 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 agitate, you know, domestic production. They, you know, they, they push and they they scream and yell narratives against the oil industry. I don't know what they expected. They tell the oil industry, we don't want you anymore, but we, we need your fuel. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, so the one thing we can guarantee is that politicians will spend the American people's money to get reelected. Absolutely. Yes, they will. Yes, they will. 100%. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they will. If there was a way to bet on that, we'd all be millionaires for sure. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Maybe we maybe predict it'll happen. <laughs> yeah, corn. Corn. You want to do it? Play corn. Perfect, guys. Thank you all so right. much for this. This has been an excellent show. Thank you so much. Thanks for your time. And guys, have a great weekend and have a great week ahead. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. That's it for this week's episode of The Week Ahead. 
Please don't forget to rate us and review on whatever platform you are watching or listening to this. Thank you.